Man, first of all, thank you for yesterday. Yeah. That was a ton of fun. The amount of time you spent first with West in the boat and then Charlie on the shore, that was more than just your professional obligation. Hunting at this point requires a ton of patience for everybody, but you're mm. putting a different kind of patience into the equation. Production, hanging out with non-hunters, why? I don't know, man. I think that one of the things that, that inspires me around kids is it's uh, I started doing things when I was really young to the point where I don't remember doing them uh, or don't remember beginning getting into it. And so for me, I harness a lot of excitement by seeing things through new people's eyes. You know, it's like more exciting for me to see someone catch a fish for the first time, say, or see my kids do something than it is for me to do it now. So I like that. I also just in general, uh, since an early age was kind of com committed to myself to finding a way to work outside and be outside, um, and invested a lot in making that true. So, uh, it's just what I like to do. And I found a way to really weave it into every aspect of life. Um, and then I am able to take all my experiences that I have outside and harness it into material. So a lot of people I think feel like, especially people who like to work a lot, you get into this sort of tension between doing your work and, and playing, you know, and, and there's a little bit of a, a trade off there. You feel guilty when you're out messing around because you should be working. But because I find so much value from a professional angle in being outside, because uh, I'm able to translate that into the material I produce. So I always feel like I'm being like productive on every level when I'm outside. I remember when I was younger and thinking about what I wanted to do for a living, and it's a cliche, but people say it, don't ever turn what you love into your work because then what you love becomes work. Yeah, I think that's stupid. I, people told me that same thing. Um, I, I had a lot of, like every kid growing up has a lot of conflicting advice. You, you hear a lot of conflicting advice. Uh, I, had a, I, have a, I have an older brother that became a game warden, right? He loved to hunt, became a game warden, never hunted again. I mean, that, that's an exaggeration, but basically if it was hunting season, he was at work. So he warned, he's like, man, don't turn this into a business. You know, you can get in trouble turning this into a business. At the same time, the, the thing, the, the one thing, like my dad never finished high school, okay? So, so he didn't have, his like, career aspirations for him weren't necessarily based off the same level that a lot of people's are, but he implored, he's like, you're going to spend a third of your life working, you have to find something you like to do. Um, he was a little bit off on that because I feel like I spend more than the third doing it, but he was right. Like he didn't care. Are you getting that, picking up that dog? I don't it? care. Oh, okay. <laughs> no, I don't care. <laughs> Here's an, look, that's a live animal in the house. At oh, okay. least he's alive. Behind you is a shot of dead animals. So we can accept that there's a lot of wildlife. No, it's kind of <laughs> distracting me. Uh, yes. So on the other hand, my dad gave me this like, like contradictory piece of advice. You told me and my brothers all the time, you're going to spend a third of your life working. You have to find something you like to do. And uh, that was really sort of his mind. In his mind, like success was finding an occupation you loved. And I focused on that, and that, that's kind of where I landed. Let's go back to that joy you were talking about sharing, catching the first fish or catching a fish with someone like my sons as opposed to doing it for yourself. You know, we talked about this yesterday. I have just a scratching the surface level of experience with guides, with outdoorsmanship, with an outfitter. And so I was behind the scenes a little bit. And I know mm -hmm. sometimes, you know, at the end of the day around the, the cook tent, there'd be conversations about, you know, there could be frustration with the way a hunter who was booking a trip handled a certain situation. Sure. Um, you don't balance that at all. Do you get frustrated? Yesterday with Charlie, he's learning. And I know we don't have to focus on one of my sons, but yeah, he's no. learning and he's learning how to roll cast. And you've done it a million times and you're sitting there watching a fish get off the hook. So that joy you feel of experiencing something anew for someone else, mm -hmm. is that ever kind of balanced against frustration of people not doing it right? Yeah, well, uh, first off, I should clarify, like, I've never guided professionally in my life. All, not all, though. Many of the guys that I hang out with all come from the guiding world. I've never done it for money, okay? So it's like I, I haven't gotten that level of cynicism <laughs> that people who, who spend 100 days 200 days on the water every year with people they don't know trying to teach them like those guys get burned out. Um, I've never had that. It comes in small doses for me. If I see that someone's committed to it and, and someone's enthusiastic and is, and is in it for, you know, what I might call the right reasons, meaning they're in it for the experience. No, I don't, I don't get as frustrated, but like, you know, I have three young kids, man. Like it's, I, I would be lying to you. I'd be lying in your face if I said I didn't get frustrated 
being out with them outside sometimes. You know, you're out, everything's frozen, there's, you know, and they stick their hands down through a hole in the ice. Yeah. And you're like, how, <laughs> why? Do you know, or, or what happened to your gloves? What happened to your hat? Why are you doing this? What happened to the, the where did the fishing rod go? You know, I mean, this is all like questions you have and it, 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 it's a struggle. Um, I can't sit and say that I don't get, uh, ir- I don't know, irritated is not the right word, uh, frustrated with, 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 with people who maybe don't have like my level of experience, but it's a, it's a goal for me to sort of get through that with a smile on my face. And, and I've learned, I've gotten better at it, I like to think. Well, your level of experience is going to be hard to match. Which brings me to this, actually. Are you harder on your kids than you are on my kids? Way. <laughs> <laughs> way i don't know what but i find that's true that's the thing i find like i was laughing about this with someone the other night it's like when i meet a parent you know and their parent a a parent immediately kind of like starts talking bad about their kids i always assume that their kids are probably great (laughs) you know when a parent's like oh my god my kids i'm like i bet they're all right just because just because you're like because you have a critical perspective you know you and i were joking before we started this conversation my one takeaway from this weekend is to quit being such a sports dad mm-hmm. because you have an entire philosophy around don't spend your weekends doing sports get outdoors hunt, well, and fish. For, for me it's, for you. it's important that, that's for me and yeah. like i'll put it this way like okay i bring a certain bag of tricks to fatherhood right like i know how to do certain things that are fun like, here's I, I put it this way the other day on a, on a podcast episode Let's say, and I'm not trying to equate myself to Michael Jordan on level, but a friend of mine, I said, like, name for me an athlete. And someone said, okay, Michael Jordan. I'm like, all right, Michael Jordan's staying at your house. And he says, I would love to take your children out to the, the court and, and, and shoot some hoops. And you'd say, no, 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 no. I'd rather you take them uh, bowling. Yeah. Right? No one would do that. So, if it, like, I feel that I have an enthusiasm for, like, a certain discipline. You know, or disciplines, hunting, fishing, whatever. Um, that's what I want to do with my kids because I can, I can show them what it's like to be passionate about something and they can have that set of experiences. And naturally, some things are going to get left off the list. And I'm definitely afraid of uh, commitment. What does that mean? Weekend commitment. Um, I, I like to take off for the weekend and, and take my kids out doing stuff or just be free to go. And I don't like the, the every Saturday you got to do whatever. You're not trying to equate yourself to Michael Jordan, but you are comparing no, yourself to Michael Jordan. I, no, I, I am. <laughs> I am only in order to make a point. Okay, but I got no, it. If you imagine right. like his expertise at his discipline and mine at mine, his is higher. You know what I think would be miserable would be Michael Jordan's son trying to play basketball. Sure. I'm curious. Um, <laughs> I'm curious. I don't like where this is going. So you might catch me. You might well, catch you know, me in a contradiction. No, no, no. Every sports dad, I think, who drives their children into sports, and I look at myself in the mirror, mm-hmm. and they're sitting right over here behind us. Yeah. On drives home from practice, on drives home from games, all the mistakes I've made on pushing too hard. Not that I'm some type of special athlete, but it's a point of focus for our relationship. As it should be, because that's your passion. It is my passion. I hope I can expand it. I would love to share this with them as well. They loved fishing yesterday, by the okay. way, and they want to hunt, and they have a ton of questions that they told me to ask you about hunting. Okay. But I'm curious, um, do, you, do you worry about being hard on your kids about hunting or, in fact, driving them away from it because of your passion, because it is a point of focus? I think every sports dad has mm. to wonder that. Am I pushing this too hard? Are you worried about that when it comes to hunting? It's definitely on my mind. I, I kind of can't believe... If some people think that I'd like drive my kids a little bit to do stuff, it's nothing like what I was brought up with. I can't believe that it didn't backfire with with me and my two older brothers the way our dad was. Um, but it, it just somehow it didn't backfire, and I kind of don't care if it does. When I first started having when I first started having kids, people would come to me and say like, "What if your kids don't like to hunt and fish as much as you do?" I would reply like, "Not many people do, right?" So I, I don't really expect it. If, if you told me that in in 20 years, my daughter would live in a large metropolitan area and have nothing to do with hunting and fishing. A, I wouldn't be surprised. B, I I wouldn't be that disappointed because I would know that whatever she went on to do, she carried with her lessons that we learned growing up. Primarily, things about how to be comfortable being uncomfortable, okay? And just certain lessons about the way life and death plays out in the woods and the wild. how to be around people who are competent, how to handle stressful situations and not get panicky, 
how to deal with risk, right? How to assess risk and deal with it in a practical, realistic way. How not to be petrified when you see a bear track, right? So she'll carry those lessons on to whatever she does. I'll still love her just as much as I do right now. I don't see it necessarily. It, it doesn't have, it's not a means to an end, right? It's not like we're doing this now because you'll always do this the rest of your life. It's like we're doing this now because this is an important thing. I view it as an important thing to learn. The same way that someone might enroll their kids in sports and be like, okay, teamwork, right? Sacrifice, discipline. There are many paths to that end goal. You know, and, and, and when you, if you get your kids playing football, I don't think that you have a realistic expectation that they're going to play in the NFL. But there's valuable stuff to take away, whatever you're going to do. That's and maybe when you're 65, someone's not laying you low with tackles, but you know what it's like to get tackled, right? It's the conversation we have all the time. We're learning not so much about the perfect pass. We're learning about resilience, how mm -hmm. to deal with failure, working within a team concept, how to be a good winner. We're trying to learn those things that apply to life, not necessarily to soccer or to football. I think as well, I think it, it, it warrants, like, I'm anything but an expert parent, but I've talked to enough parents that have been through what I've been through um, who, who've told me that if you're going to do one thing, it's you're demonstrating that someone's watching and they care, right? That they care enough to take you along and they care enough to make you go do stuff. So um, I think that just doing that is probably really impactful. And this is just happens to be how I go about doing that. So this leads me into the question I thought I was going to start with you on today. Um, and that is why? Why do you do all this? Now, I've read a ton of interviews you've given. I've read mm -hmm. about you. I watch Meat Eater. And I know you're a pretty philosophical dude, especially when it comes to hunting, calling yourself an environmentalist with a gun. In other words, you're thinking about things and you're answering the question of why on a lot of levels. But I'm curious... Why is it important for you to spend, I believe, as you said, probably half your year, not a third, but a half of your life in the work environment? Mm -hmm. So what is it about outdoorsmanship and hunting and fishing? Why do you do it? That, it that's kind of impossible, impossible for me to answer because the, the thing was there before I bothered to ask why. Do you follow me? Like you can see someone going through life and then they, they start putting all these realizations together and they, and they start reading and, and they realize, man, I need to make some change about myself. Right. And then later you'd say, well, why did you have this fundamental shift in your lifestyle? And they'd be like, it was, it's calculated decision based on, you know, research yeah. and understanding, you know, for me, it was very different because it was something that, that, out, like being an outdoorsman was something that I've always defined myself as. There was never a decision to do that, right? The decision was sort of made for me before I was born in a way. It was just like, that's how I was brought up. I never stopped doing it. I never questioned doing it. I never paused and re-engaged. So all my analysis about why I'm interested in what I'm interested in is all after the fact. If I had never stopped to even think about it in any kind of philosophical sense, I would probably still be engaged in the exact same activities I'm engaged in now. Instead, I just look now and then like, why does it appeal to me? Um, I'm curious about why it appeals to me, but I don't know that there's any answer I would come up with that would change what I feel to be like a very elemental part of myself. What's more is in all the examinations I've done, I've never come to this idea that it's something I should stop. In fact, I've learned that, that the, the, what I'm interested in is a sustainable practice, if done right. It's a thing that has always gone on. No matter how you want to define the beginning of human history, we've been engaged in these pursuits nonstop, without pause. So I'm part of this like long continuum of human activity. It's interesting to me, but it's, there's, nothing, there's probably nothing anyone would tell me that would make me altogether... Uh, stop. It's just, it's too inside. Okay, so I get what you're saying. It's part of your identity, and it's been part of your identity as long as you can remember. But look, I'm listening to you, and you're very introspective, and you read, and you love history, and you're talking about this continuum through human history that outdoorsmanship has played. And I just, I feel like you're flirting around the edges of something. I don't know that it's identifiable, but mm -hmm. it's definitely deeper. So what is it that keeps driving you out into the mountains. Like when you're out there and there's no cameras oh, and there's yeah, no media. Is it spiritual for you? Is it a connection to history? Clearly, I just heard that from you. 
Um, what is it that it means to you beyond just, I don't know, and it's going to be hard for you. Maybe it won't be hard for you to put into words. Yeah, I got, yeah, I got what you're saying. And it's something I think about a fair bit. One of the things, uh, I, I was writing something about fishing one time and I was talking about how every time you make a cast, it's like you're sort of asking the water a question, you know, there's, there's like a constant curiosity about what will happen. Mm-hmm. I think that, um, the unpredictability of nature, the unpredictability of wilderness is very like that draws you in this idea of there's, there's innumerable factors like take fishing yesterday. There's innumerable, innumerable factors that you, that you can't control. Some you can understand, some you'll never understand. So like water temperature, barometric pressure, what's happening in the mountains with water coming down from snow melt, right? All these factors, the aquatic insects and what they're doing, where the fish want to be, right? You can't assemble all the pieces to understand it. You have to kind of go experience it and look at it. That draws me in all the time. Another thing that draws me in is I'm very interested in the history of human engagement with nature. Um, and so to be, uh, I can be my own case study in, in what that looks like, right? I'm interested in environmental health. I'm interested in, you know, the kind of fecundity of the land, right? It's ability to produce wildlife and produce animals and produce experiences that I like to enjoy. So I just have to see it like knowing it's there isn't enough. I want to like see it and breathe it and experience it. Whatever it is that you're connecting to in nature and in this practice. I mean, I think it's clear that more and more people are seeking something in that connection. Mm. You know, I'm not trying to give you the answer to the question that I ask you, but if I ask myself, why do I want to do this more? And you touched on some of the lessons, but the lessons lived on top of something else. I think, I don't think hunting and fishing is particularly or exclusively masculine, but I think masculinity is something that a lot of men are searching for, a reconnection to a practice that men have been a part of sure, throughout yeah. human history. I think being a part of nature, um, I don't know what your, your faith might be, but um, what it, it, I mean, I think a lot of people get out there and they have a connection to God. You know, I think something happened in the last couple of years where more people are seeking whatever is out there. Yeah, I, I think there's a, there's a matter of being involved in something larger than oneself. I also think that if you look, we, we saw across the board an outdoor engagement whether it's, it's going camping, boating, hunting, fishing, whatever. The pandemic, for kind of like two reasons, greatly increased outdoor engagement. And I think this is global, but we'll talk about it nationally. One, you, for a minute, stripped away people's ability to go and do activities they might have normally engaged in just out of sort of inertia, Right. Like people weren't going to restaurants, they weren't going to music venues. And so, you know, people want to get out and they go and do that. So there's this kind of, you take one thing away from someone and then they have to go to plan B. And as it turned out, overwhelmingly, plan B was outdoor activities. There's something else was at play though, I think, is that you, you kind of wrestle with this idea of like things that are out of one's control, right? We're getting all these like, like global issues with, with how disease moves around the world, um, transportation was impacted. I think people had a strong desire to go and do things where they could really feel the result of their own efforts and just kind of like take control of something. If you look right now, I mean, this is just talking besides the pandemic. We have very little, uh, we live in a very specialized society, right? There's so many things we don't do. For many of us now, like you, you don't change the oil in your car, you definitely don't process, you know, your own waste, you turn the faucet on, water comes out. It, everything is very automated. And I'm not condemning that. that that's like a celebrated aspect of civilization, right? You can focus on the things you love to do. But with outdoor pursuits, you can kind of get this feeling of like what it's like to like really be in control of a situation. If you're going to be out in the cold and be warm, it's because you're taking action to be warm. You know, if you're going to go out and try to secure your own meal with like a, make it to make a meal from wild foods, uh, it's your chance to go and witness the sort of A to Z process involved. And I think that really appeals to people because it makes you feel like for once, right, for, for this moment, you're, you're in control of every aspect of something and get to see the entirety of something play out. And that I think, spe- you know, that really speaks to people. It speaks to me. And that's one of my driving things with my kids is, is uh, you know, those are, I'm going to mutilate the quote. There's a quote from Aldo Leopold where he talks about, um, 
thinking that. Oh, never mind. Scrap the quote. I can't. I'll, okay, I'll, I'll, I'll mutilate it too bad. <laughs> it's to the, the effect way, of. By the way, start to finish. This is my podcast as well as this interview. So that this is. Uh, this is. They get to see the real you, the one that loses oh. the quote in real time. Okay, right. so let me tell you. Let me let me tell you the quote then. Okay. It's something to the effect of, uh, uh, you know, the sin of thinking that heat comes from the stove and food comes from the store. Yeah. Or whatever it is. Meaning they've never chopped wood. Yep. Right. You haven't chopped wood and you haven't seen food produced. And, and I think that, um, as much as I admire that guy, he's the guy that wrote San Connie Almanac, right? Well, he, let, me, you know, let me tell you another great quote that I can't remember. Um, it is a same guy. It is a poor life that achieves freedom from fear. Um, and, and that's another thing I like about the outdoors, right? It's another thing I like about hunting and fishing is that you're kind of living in this, this arena of consequence. You know, remember yesterday when we go to get on the boats and we're talking about, okay, if you fall in, here's the deal. Uh, it's like a realistic thing. It's a cold river, fast moving water. There's rapids in there, right? You fall in, that's trouble, man. And you're going to live right on the edge of that trouble. And you're going to hold in your head, like what you're going to do when that trouble happens. And if you do this long enough, it will happen. Right. Um, so I think that like being in proximity or like I said, that uh, an arena of consequence, right? You're in a world where you do this and you'll suffer from that. Right. I like that space. Lifetime of hunting and fishing. What's the closest you got to paying that consequence? Oh man. I don't, uh, you know, the most dramatic ones for sure, because they're just, they're just dramatic. It'd be like grizzly bear encounters. You know, I've had a few of those, um, one very close call. With, What's that mean? How oh, close? Like it's open agape mouth here. Really? Oh yeah. yeah. Within a foot or two. Probably 18 inches. I need to know the details of how an open mouth bear comes within 18 inches and eat, we're eat, sitting here talking. Eating lunch. Uh -huh. Okay. Eating lunch. Meet like imagine me and you and a few other guys. And we had a elk hanging in a tree. Um, and we were coming back to retrieve. We hauled half the meat away and we're coming back to retrieve the other half of the meat. And we decided for some stupid reason to have lunch under the tree mm -hmm. with all the meat hanging in it. And when this, this brown bear, this is on a Fognac Island in Alaska, when this brown bear came in, it came in and for some reason passed me by and went for my buddy. And he smoked it across the nose with a set of trekking poles. I mean, like, he's there, I'm here, it's here. And he, whap. And when he hit it, it spun. And my other buddy who was standing right here, like it somehow stepped on my ankle. And I had a, my ankle was messed up for a while. It spun. My other buddy fell on it and rode its back down a hill. So this and bear no comes in over bit. your no shoulder. No one got bit. No one got, this no. bear comes in over your shoulder. Yeah. Your buddy sees it charging, I assume, because he's looking yeah, over so your shoulder. Yeah, so you're my friend Giannis. Yeah. I'm me. Giannis he goes right here. Crew. Yeah, and Giannis name. smoked it right across the bridge of the nose with a set. He had a pistol and pepper spray, but when when like the rubber met the road, closest thing he trekking could find. poles, and it spins the bear. <laughs> spun it, which yeah. is kind of odd. I think the trekking pole. He said it was the most. He he described it as the most sort of like unexpected outcome <laughs> yeah. of something would be that it would run from that. Yeah, but I think also when it came in, it didn't know that there was many of us as there was, and I think it surprised it. And one of your buddies jumped on its back? Fell on its back. Fell on its back. Yeah, and rode it down. You know. <laughs> Dude, I'm telling you, it was a close call, man. It messed me up for a long it, it messed me up for a little bit because um I there's all this weird psychological stuff that happens to you in know, like moments of high stress. They actually train people. You know, there, there's two kinds of in analyzing this event and how everybody behaves and what they did, there's people that go into a and there's people that go into a, a traumatic situation they focus on a thing okay let's see you come in there's a horrible vehicle crash right you come in there's an injured person on the ground that's all you see and then later you recount it you're like man i just was so i didn't see anything but this right mm -hmm. or there's people who don't focus on anything and they're like describe it as all the blur right i'm the kind of person who uh focused on one thing a set of teeth and then entered into what I call a mind movie mm -hmm. where I was living in the future and someone had died Well, someone died right now. And I was living in a future where I was suffering that remorse. So you're saying when you revisit this moment, that's sort of the prism through that's which what you I always did. see it. Even though it was like that long, that's what I was doing. Mm. I wasn't hitting it with a track and pole. I was like in, I was paralyzed.
for, for some moment. To, put it this way. You're Giannis on me. I didn't know that you hit it with a track and pole. Really? No. How impressed so, are you, by the way, with Giannis' reaction to that moment? What's that? How impressed are you with Giannis' reaction to that moment? He's the guy I should have been. <laughs> I should have I should have grabbed it by the scruff of its neck. Hey, when I asked so, you so, this, by the way, you said multiple. So, to be honest, you're like, God. Oh, that was, yeah. But tell me that's the main one. Yeah, that's, that's one of the main ones. But, I mean, I, I guess, yeah, like, they just occupy a lot of mind space. Yeah. Grizzly bears do. I mean, in this state, you know, they kill a couple people every year. So yeah, yesterday you were pointing and, and, a guy and, like, and a it's week typically ago. when that happens and you hear about it, it's typically people that I would call like not friends of mine, but my peer group. Yep. Um, there's people doing the activities I like to do. So that's the thing that, that stays with me because it's so dramatic. Far more people die of hypothermia. Um, and I've had hypothermia, but it doesn't, it doesn't, it doesn't like, or I've been in a hypothermic state. But that doesn't stick to you because it doesn't have it doesn't have that psychological force yeah. that I think other stuff does. Uh, hit up in Alaska, hitting a you know boating and hitting a submerged log, mm-hmm. right? I, I look at that. Um, I was with my wife before we were married. Um, hit a submerged log, took on a bunch of water. If we'd have gone in that water, you'd been you'd been dead in ten minutes. Absolutely, like, you'd absolutely been dead. There's no way you would have lived. So. Uh, that was close, but it doesn't have that. It doesn't have that cool factor like like bears do. You know, bears just live with you, man. I'm, I'm kind of like I'm, I'm, I don't want to say I'm obsessed with them, but uh, we have my my buddies and I have a term we call it called bearanoia, right? Where you're just like deathly afraid of bears. I try to. I don't have that, but I think about them all the time. Well, it, I can't speak for you, but it's the one thing out there. I guess the mountain lion as well, but it's the one thing out there that is hunting you as much as you're hunting everything else. Yeah, and mountain lions, man, it's like non-issue. Right. They, they, they just don't do anything to anybody, ever. Well, for instance, I remember recently Washington had its first mountain lion fatality, meaning a mountain lion that killed a person in 90 years. Oregon had its first in the state's history. It's just, it's not an issue. Black bears aren't an issue, but grizzly bears are like, they're like, you know, there's something, man. So you said a lot of things here that, that, that made me think. First of all, we have similarities. Maybe I'm flattering myself, but we have some similarities. Um, I started trying to write in 2000. You started writing in 2000. I was in Missoula, by the way. Oh, okay. Submitting articles to the Missoulian. Oh, really? Um, at that time. Yeah. But what you said that, that I feel like... I used to be friends with the guy you needed to know. I, I didn't know him. <laughs> um, he, no, was but the the sport, he was the sports guy there. The thing that you said, That's exactly the guy I probably submitted the article to. I can remember it. Um, Fear. We shouldn't run from the concept of fear. But I struggle with this because I think the United States, I think the world has been driven by the emotion of fear irrationally over mm-hmm. the last two years. Oh, yeah, man. But I like what you the said about... The pandemic really brought that out. Oh, uh, To me, it brought out the fact that's the human, that's the hu- primary human motivator, not ambition. It is fear. If yeah. you ask us, if you break us down to our most elemental driving force, it is fear. Mm-hmm. Um, and, I, you know, but you shouldn't run from that. So I told you yesterday that I got my boys into skateboarding when they were younger yeah and part of that's because i wanted them to learn how to surf so we'd have a hobby we could do when they got older but the other part of that for me was here you got to drop in on this eight feet of concrete and it's terrifying and by the way for the record i've never done it in my life yeah but i'd like you to do it but I, you have to do it <laughs> you have to do it because you need to face that fear and learn to overcome it because if you give into the fear you lean back you crash you fall mm. if you overcome the fear there's a lot of joy and accomplishment on the other side of that fear. So I really like what you said. I agree with that idea of you can't run from fear. It's going to be here and you just learn to live with it. Yeah, I, I, that, that's one of the primary things that, that I've tried to, you know, motivate myself is, is recognize, uh, speaking of the outdoors particularly, um, recognizing those things that make me nervous and finding a way to be through it. I remember growing up, we would hunt deer out of tree stands, okay? And this is in the Michigan heavy forest. Uh, my old man would take me out when I was 12, okay? And he, even a little bit, 11, 12, take me out and set me in a tree stand, okay? Down in some ravine, right? And then he'd be like, I'm going to come get you after dark. And I'm telling you, man, that period of time between when dark hit and when my dad showed up felt like a week of nighttime. It was, it was terrifying. It was terrifying. And, and, and like you're watching it get dark and everything turns into a black bear, right? Every noise is whatever. 
you couldn't even tell what you were afraid of, right? Uh, I gradually over, I overcame that now. I could be quite comfortable. Did you tell your dad I don't want to go back out? No, no. But I'll tell you what. You, you, going bow hunting, okay? Um, I would now and then, if I woke up in the morning, I would kind of be hoping that the weather was too bad that he wouldn't go. Because if there's no way that if they, like, if my family went, there's no way I, because I would feel too guilty. I'd feel like a failure. So I would sometimes be like, God, I hope they don't go. Because the last thing I'm going to do is not go. Like, I have to go. But I don't want to go. That was, it was like that kind of a environment. But uh, being petrified of that stuff, man, I'm not now, you know. Uh, I get out in, in Southeast Alaska. We spend a lot of time out doing stuff in small boats, right? Big water, small boats. Um, that's scary. The last thing I'm going to do is not go, but it's a thing like, why is it scary? What things could happen? How do you be prepared for those things to happen? And then you can do all that gaming, right? You can do all that scenario planning and having your equipment dialed, having your expertise down, but there's still, when you shove off, there's still like this little thing, right? Um, this little thing in the back of your head that like, you're kind of in a serious situation. So I want to go back to, I want to start talking about meat eater, but I want to go back to another thing you said that resonated with me and I'll, I'll match you butchering Leopold's quote. Is that what it was? Okay, yeah, yeah. By butchering one you're, myself. You're going to misquote someone? Yeah, absolutely. I don't know if you've ever seen it because I don't even know if it's a quote, if it's a poem or what it is, but the, the mystery of the pencil, that, that no single person in modern society could create a pencil from scratch. There's no one out there that could, you know, mine the aluminum, chisel the wood, find the lead do whatever it takes to create the eraser from rubber. No human being could do everything from start to finish from the pencil. Yeah. It's a society of specialization, and I know that's a, couple, a good thing. Not me, but I know a couple of contenders, but you're probably right. <laughs> All of it. The eraser, the... the if the you gave them a couple of decades, they'd come close. <laughs> um, but that's, that's a mark of a society who has specialized and advanced, and it's a yeah. good thing to your point. Yeah. But over the past two years, I think people have been attracted to what you said, the idea of self-sufficiency. Mm -hmm. And the numbers have, have, have borne it out. Yeah. I think from my home state of Texas, hunting licenses are up something like 7%. Your home state of Michigan, I think I read up 67%. Yeah, they had yeah, a huge increase in first people doing the hunter safety courses. Right. Yeah, for sure. So, so when did you realize you were going to be a TV star? I, there's a, I'm going to give you, a, since we're matching quote for quote, yeah. uh, there's a humorist named Jerry Clower from Mississippi. He, de he died in the late 90s, but he had always said that he backed into show business. I kind of backed into show business, to be honest. Uh, I, I was very dedicated to being a writer. I still regard myself as a writer. If, if when someone like chisels something on my, I don't want a tombstone, but if I did, and someone chiseled something on it, I would much rather it say writer than, than television host, right? I was just focused on that. But that, like, there's a trajectory that, folks go through. Um, I started doing magazine work. Magazine work led to doing books. I started doing books. Books led to doing television. Um, in a weird way, television led to doing a, a podcast, right? Uh, one might look and think like that there was a sort of drift or, or a mission creep, you know, that I went from like actually writing everything I did to make money to doing all those other things and to, to large measure oftentimes talking. Um, but the set of ideas I've dealt with has been constant. You know, I've dealt with the natural world and humans and the natural world and that relationship. I, I've dealt with that the whole time. Looking back on it now, it's not that strange. But it did feel very weird to me at first that to, to, get into, to get into TV because I had a kind of a, you know, I went to MFA school. I had a kind of snobbish view of um, the hierarchy of media. And I held being a writer very high. Um, but you don't, if you have a thing you want to share with people, uh, a set of ideas you want to grapple with and share with people, I, I think you need to be pretty el elastic in, in, in how you traffic in those ideas. What was that initial transition? How did you end up on TV the first time? Oh, like really, like in a, in a total yeah. pragmatic way? I mean, there's a, you know, if, you, if I looked at my career, and there, there are moments, there are, if you said, where were the big transition moments or the big trampoline moments, I could probably point those out. No, I no, have yeah, to... I could tell you exactly. What was it? So I started, once I started writing and doing magazine work, I would, go, I would be out 
finding out about stuff, doing stuff, having adventures, right? Mm -hmm. And then in television producers, don't, they don't have that luxury of being out. And so I would get, I would get, the best word for it is I would get like summoned to TV meetings where people kind of want to feel you out about what's going on out in America, you know? Yeah. <laughs> and, and, I, and I guess at some point someone thought uh, instead of just being a source of ideas, he, here's a person that would potentially be the, the one who would deliver those ideas. I went through development agreements. I did like this development agreement at History Channel, right, that didn't pan out. I wound up doing a eight series or an eight part show for Travel Channel just because like it was pitching ideas off my writing. Um, but I was dragged into it. Like I became a writer by uh, like a, a very, a force of will. Okay. I like, I, I, I wrestled that out of my life. Um, TV wasn't quite like that. Like I, I think that in, in some measure, other people wrestled it out of me. Right. That they saw that I could do it and I found it in me to do it, but it wasn't a thing that I fought for. What was a big trampoline moment? I mean, I'll be real. I didn't see the show when it was on Travel Channel, or I think you had one on Sportsman Channel. Netflix was a big... Yeah. For, for us, when we started seeing you and watching your show, it was when it appeared on Netflix. So it was, we, The trampoline moment for me was when I fell into the orbit of 0.0, .0 production in New York. So most famously, they made all the Bourdain properties over the years. And um, once I began to collaborate with them and try to find something to do, like they liked my writing and they understand writers and understood writers... Uh, once they took an interest in what I was doing, it was probably at that point it was gonna happen. When was that? In '99, maybe. In '99. Oh no, 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 no! That's not true. Sorry, I was off by a decade. That was probably around 2010. That's what I was thinking. Yeah, yeah. yeah I finished school. I finished school and I finished graduate school in 2000, mm -hmm. and I started to film, like to do sort of speculative pitch type stuff in 2009. And Meat Eater started in 10? We started, we started Meat Eater a decade ago. Yeah, yeah. a decade ago now. Yeah. And that was the thing that we owned outright. So I, I built that with 0, 0.0 production before we turned it into its own company. I built that as a joint venture between me and 0, 0.0 production. We owned it. So as you probably know, normally with, like a, if a production company makes a show for a cable network, I, when I'm talking to people who aren't in the biz, I always kind of explain it like a contractor builds a house for someone. Mm -hmm. Once they hand them the keys, like the contractor doesn't walk back in the house, right? You're handing this property over to the commissioning force. What we do with meat eaters, we built something that we owned everything. We only licensed. We, we never done anything besides license meat eater to people. We've always owned it. Every production still, everything that's come out of it, we own. Um, which is a very, very different way of going about it. And, and 0, 0.0 kind of like, if they if they had some sort of visionary moment around the stuff we were doing, it was to make a thing that we owned. So to this day, that's our that our company owns everything we've ever filmed. From a piece of content, what do you think it is that sets Meat Eater apart from the dozens, if not hundreds, of other not just hunting but cooking shows out there? What is it that makes Meat Eater popular? Man, I don't know. I can't really answer that. Uh, one of the things that that helped it there was three there's there's three guys that when we when we started coming up with the idea there was three guys i was working with jared jared andrew canis nick brigden and a dude named mo fallon and these were all guys that had camp that had come up from working on bourdain's show these guys didn't that didn't, didn't hunt definitely didn't hunt barely fished okay but they understood story and they understood personality and they understood like what it's like to have an opinion. Okay, they had no interest in hunting. Oh, I shouldn't say that. No background in it. But they were like, this thing that you do is cool and it has all these elements of like what's a great story. So they came at it from a storytelling media perspective and didn't come at it with like preconceived notions about like what it should look like. Typically, in, in the sphere I'm in. Okay, if we get into like like outdoor television, it's often everyone involved in the production is all coming from the same world that I came from. People that are like the camera guys, the editors, they're all people that grew up hunting and fishing, typically, right? And they all have consumed that media for their lives. And so they're making a they're making a 
I don't want to say a facsimile, but they're making something strongly based in a pre-existing thing. There's like, they're aware of this idea that there's like outdoor television and here's what it looks like. Here's how it feels. Let's go make our version. Um, I, I didn't take in that kind of material growing up. Um, didn't really look at it, was largely unaware of it. And I was working with people who had no preconceived idea of what it was supposed to be. So we were able to start from a very clean place. And we accidentally made something different. In fact, when we first started doing Meat Eater, I would often have conversations with people. And, and they, they, people would feel that we were making a commentary on hunting television. That, that our thing was deliberately different in a way that was meant to comment on this genre. That was the last thing on my mind. I would never, I, like, it was no way any kind of comment on anything other than I was capturing a thing that I liked how I liked it. And I was working with people who were really good at capturing stuff. Was the concept of Meat Eater actually reflective of how your passion for hunting applied to your life? In other words, it was as much about the cooking and eating aspect of it as it was to the, the gaming aspect. Yeah, because that was a very important thing to me. And we did this Travel Channel show, and the show was, I mean, that process was miserable, Right. There was too many people trying to make it too many things for too many people. It was a complete and total mess. I, I didn't know enough to know how stupid it was, right? It was bad, right? Just way too many voices in the room. When we came out of that, I came out of that being friends with the people I just talked about. And we're like, man, if we, when we get the chance, we're going to do the most stripped down, bare bones version of this that's like an actual true like capture like an actual living true relationship with hunting and just do that and let that speak for itself and see how that works and, and that's what we did we did something clean i mean we'll do a whole, we, we were doing whole episodes that might be in six square miles with one person on camera right everything was like very just stripped down i have a friend who hunts a lot um and he actually wanted me to ask you this. How much does the production aspect disrupt the hunt? Depends how good the guys are. Like we have, we, we have a lot of the same people we've worked with for a very long time, the camera guys, and, and they become good at being in the outdoors. But it can, be, it can be pretty, if you just took people who were totally green to it, um, it'd be pretty miserable. Because there's a thing, there's like, you need to, crew okay like camera guys need to understand that they're gonna have to sacrifice some parts of what they think they should be doing like how they're getting the shot because i always tell them like if we did it your way there's gonna be nothing to film we're gonna have to find a way to compromise here where you're gonna film and i'm gonna do what i need to do and if you give me room to do what i need to do you'll have cool stuff to film if you don't give me room to what i need to do ain't nothing gonna happen so, like, you got to get comfortable with the fact that everything is not perfect and it's a fun tension. We laugh about it and fight about it all the time uh, and have, like, it's kind of one of the driving tensions between me and them is um, I know what needs to happen. They know what needs to happen. These are different things. Like, they want coverage. I want action. And, and we find a way to make those two things work. As much as there's more order, you know, like hunting big game animals, right? There's, like, more human odor, and human odor is your enemy. There's more movement. Movement's your enemy. But there's also, in a lot of ways, there's more eyeballs. And camera guys that we work with, that we've worked with for years, develop a pretty good game eye, man. Oh. And a lot of times, they'll be like, psst. Oh, <laughs> so there's, there's a few benefits. Oh, there, yeah, there yeah. are some <laughs> benefits. It, it, we, and like I said, we have a lot of fun with it, and we laugh about it. But yeah, it, it, it's way, way easier to do stuff without them around. But I really enjoy it. Like, I've developed very, very close friendships um, with the, the folks I work with, and I, and I love being around them. What's your favorite hunt? And maybe if I asked you, you are only allowed to hunt one game for the rest of your life, what are you going to choose? Uh, we have, in this state, we have a youth deer season, where it's a two-day season, um, kids only. I would just hunt youth. If I had to do one thing the rest of my life, I would hunt youth deer season with my kids. It's the most fun in the world. There's no one around. Uh, yes, it's a riot. And then there's like some states have youth turkey seasons. I just think it's, it's just a riot because the thing is, I couldn't hunt if I wanted to. It'd be illegal. So I'm just able to really focus, you know, on them. And that's a good time to me.
I'll never miss. I'll never miss the youth year season. And the way my kids are laid out, they can do it for five years. I got many years of youth deer season ahead of me. But you and I were hanging out yesterday. You were talking about free diving, spear fishing off of oil rigs in Louisiana, mm -hmm. dodging infrastructure of the oil rigs, going to Hawaii, clear water, yep. spear fishing. I know you've gone to, I think it's Bolivia and hunt monkeys. Yep. I mean, well, I was, yeah, I was with Amber Indians who were hunting monkeys, and then I had to, uh, not had to, ate the monkeys with them. And What's was, monkey taste like? It's just like, you know, it tastes like uh, the way they cook it, it tastes like smoked cables. cables. I mean, it's, it's dry. <laughs> <laughs> like if you put liquid smoke on a piece of steel cable, yeah, that, that's how they. That's how they. They, they really. Okay, so like what's, to, what's they really the like worst to cook thing? stuff a long time. <laughs> what's the worst thing you, as you've done this and prepared what you've you've killed? What's the worst thing you've eaten? Um, I wrote a book about buffalo uh, called American Buffalo, and um, I would read about practices of the hide hunters, like mountain men and hide hunters, and you know other. Uh, people who lived off the land and I would read about how they would take sometimes they would flavor they just get burned out on eating buffalo meat and they'd flavor it with weird stuff they put gunpowder on it oh. and eat it and one time I read about how they would put a uh, bile well that's the Comanches did I just yeah. learned that in the last couple yeah. of weeks they'd take the bile and squeeze it onto the meat yeah and it was a delicacy so I read about bile on liver yeah and um that was probably the worst thing that I've ever put in my mouth. Really? Oh yeah, it'd be like if you, you know, if you took a nine volt battery <laughs> and held it. So I imagine, just read that the Comanches would call the kids over. Hey, yeah. we got the bile ready. This Dude, there's is a lot of things day. that people. There's been some real surprises, and that's one of the things I like about history so much is you read about these food items. Uh, there's this guy, Bill Jalmer uh, Stephenson, who spent a lot of time with the with Eskimo and Inuit hunters in the you know northern Canada, northern Alaska, and he would say that when they would kill a caribou, first thing they would do is pop out the eyeball and they like the fat they like to eat the fat from behind the eyeball okay so we do this all the time now where you get a gob of that fat and eat it and i'm telling you man you put it in your mouth and you think you had pizza dough in your mouth so and, and I, it, it's like it's absolutely like putting a piece of raw pizza dough in your mouth so that's kind of an interesting discovery the mountain men the beaver trappers they were always cooking beaver tails and i didn't even when i used to read that when i was a kid i didn't even know what it meant I thought there. I thought it was like uh, someone messed up and wrote the wrong thing down, and it meant that they ate like the back hams, the back legs, but they meant the tail. The tail. And when you cook that tail and get the scales off, it's just it's like the fat and gristle from a beef steak hiding inside the tail. So you imagine that you're eating this like ex this diet of extraordinarily lean meat all the time. You're just like living on game meat. Um, you get deprived of fat. And so you imagine here's this like beaver tail and it's like this little pocket of fat and oil and how good that tastes. It, it, you know, if you imagine that you go hungry for a long time, for days, and you're just not getting what you want. You know how like how a pepperoni pizza emerges yeah. in your mind as sort of like, at least it does for me. Like you just want something like, you know, you're hungry and you're not thinking, I'm going to get the biggest salad man's ever seen. <laughs> right. right. You're like, I'm going to get the greasiest pizza, you know, and it has, it satisfies that that urge. Oh, that explains, when I read that stuff about Indians squeezing bile onto liver or onto meat, my assumption was, well, think about our palate today. Mm -hmm. We've been exposed to so many different flavors that we're always searching for something new that yeah. tastes good. Theirs was so limited, so that was the, that was the delicacy, that was yeah. exotic. It'd be like how, but yeah, you're how, saying also their body was speaking to them. I, 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 need, I need high protein, I need fat, I need something, and then you reverse engineer that into tasting good. Yeah, I think that, that I think that that that's that both the things you're saying I've thought about and I think both things are true. One, there's a monotony and you're breaking the monotony of, of taste, right? And you can see that where if you look at other p groups of people who are introduced to new things, um, you know, you like take people who've never had sugar and introduce them to sugar, they taste it and they love the way it tastes and something in their body is like, it's like a high energy thing. Something in their body's like, eat more of that, you right. know? Um, but with the food thing too, with all the weird things people used to eat, and I like to experiment with it, is you can't, you can't just eat lean meat and stay alive, right? You have mineral deficiencies, vitamin deficiencies. You have to eat this wide array of things. So when we look at it now, it just seems like bizarre stuff, but you're just giving your body what it needs. Um, I don't need, I found that I don't need and don't relish uh, bile. <laughs> but I tried it and it was probably the, definitely the worst taste I've ever had. Other things have been surprising. 
for me, there's like there's things that you think will be bad, and they, they are in fact bad. Okay, bile. I'm like, that can't taste good. In fact, it doesn't brains. taste good. Have you tr I'm sure you've had brains. Yeah, don't like it. Okay. Don't like it. There's things that you... Um, oysters? Rocky Mountain oysters? Love them. Re love them? Really? Yeah, pr prepared properly. <laughs> yeah. We used to go to this thing every year called the Testicle Festival. I lived right next to the Testicle Festival. Oh. I was telling you where I lived. <laughs> okay. I mean, I literally lived yeah. I, a nine iron from the Testicle Festival. Yeah, I didn't mind those. I didn't mind those. So every September we'd have those. Um, and, and prepared a lot of them. Uh, we make them out of, you know, we take game animals. We make a dish called hot buttered buck nuts, and we'll cook oysters that way. Uh, some things, though, you expect them to taste good, and they do taste good, and that's fun, but right, um, predictable. The things that I like are the things that you think would be horrible, but you taste them, and it's actually not that bad. Like what? You know, like bone marrow. I um, think a lot of people think of marrow as being something they probably wouldn't like. You know, but I remember the first time uh, years ago when we started sawing open bones on like elk bones. And cooking the marrow out of them, which is another thing I learned from reading about, you know, Ice Age hunters, Paleo Indians. They seem to have, there's a lot of evidence at archaeological sites that they were always cracking bones open. Mm -hmm. um, like, why the hell are they cracking the bones open? Well, probably to extract marrow. What's that all about, right? And you go eat it, it's, it's like shockingly good. Mm. Um, it's a thing that, that I will prepare now and then if I'm just trying to make something that would interest people and taste good. Well, yeah, I like that you're tying history into this. I mean, I grew up hunting a fair amount, but what we always did is fry it, whatever mm -hmm. it was. Oh, yeah, and I know yeah. I read that you guys did the same growing oh, up. Oh, man. And so everything, everything. everything tastes good battered and fried. Yeah. Almost everything. So you're being creative, you're being culinary, but you're also being historical about it. I want to go back to business for a second. We're talking about trampoline moments. Um, there's several different moments if I look from the outside. I would have to think the move to Netflix exposed you to yet a bigger audience. I would have to think the pandemic shoved a bunch of new viewers your way as well. And clearly what's going on at this moment, hanging out with you yesterday, is you're in a massively explosive moment for Meat Eater. I mean, you're, I heard you're hiring multiple people every month. Mm -hmm. um, I know you took hedge fund or venture fund financing a few years ago. Yep. I mean, this is a whole different thing, Steve, right? Now, I mean, doing what you were doing, bootstrapping it, it seems to me, looking from the outside, you're moving, you're making the transition from a bootstrap entrepreneurial perspective to something else. You're moving into the phase of we're an operation that license our brands, create multiple products, and have a ton of people under the ceiling. Yeah. Uh, it's been great. It's, been, it, it's happened very fast, and it's uh, multiple ways of looking at it. One, just from a productivity standpoint, if I look at like projects that I myself am very involved in, um, when I was doing book, it, it takes two years to do a book. Right. I did the, the first three books I did, I did totally on my own. And I'd spend a couple years working on those books. So you, you put out something and there's a long point in time when you're, you're just working very quietly behind the scenes. Right. From a media perspective, now that I work with a team of people, um, we have I don't know, f we're currently working on three books. We have, I don't know, four or five more projects under contract. So we're able to, like, because I have a team of people that I work with very closely and very effectively, we're able to greatly increase the output. Weekly podcasts, mm -hmm. we're, we're putting out video material every day, right? So it, it's fun to see this where ideas go from conception to reality really quickly, and that's rewarding. Another thing is if you, if you imagine um, an outdoor media business, uh, which we didn't invent the idea of having an outdoor media business, they would often have, like, they, they would find funding or, you know, generate revenue by basically being a, 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 an ad source, okay? People buy advertisement mm -hmm. against your, your website or your magazine or whatever. Uh, when, we, when I started working with TCG, the, the investment group that enabled us to create Meat Eater into a company, right, and turn it into a full-fledged company, we were able to, we had funding and also expertise to go, build our own revenue streams, right? So we have done a number of acquisitions in the outdoor space. Um, one of our first sponsors, this is like a traditional sponsor of our show, was, was an apparel company called First Light. They became a sponsor of us when they were making merino base layers, right? We grew up together. They now make a full-fledged, like everything, full line of like stellar hunting apparel, okay? But we grew up together. And did something pretty unusual where here's this media entity that in the end acquired 
this apparel company, even though we grew up together, like we acquired the apparel company and we're all rolled into the same thing now. Um, there's a Phelps, uh, Phelps game call, it's a game call company. I became friends with the founder. We did a bunch of work together. We were able to, to, to bring Phelps game calls into Meat Eater. Same with FHF gear. I knew the founder, we hung out, used their products, we're able to mature that relationship and, and bring it in where we were able to come in together under the same thing. So that, that, like, that approach is unprecedented. And you've got a lot of help, as you point out now. And you're giving me, and it's awesome to watch you grow. I mean, I know you're licensing the Meat Eater brand as well to, I think, for example, Benchmade Knives or other products yeah, oh, yeah, that yeah, exist yeah, yeah. out there. But I got to think, you know, here you were, you were a writer, first of all, mm -hmm. and then pretty much a... You're part of a team, always, but a solo-driven entrepreneur. And now you're, you're, you're something different now. You're, first of all, managing people is tough, and it changes your day-to-day. -day. Has that been hard? It's extremely hard, man. Uh, and I, I don't do much of it. Okay. Uh, there was a period of time where me and one of my colleagues, Tracy Crane, we had to sort of co-CEO our company for a while, and, and I don't like that. Okay. <laughs> that's, right. not where my, that's not my strengths, man. Uh, anything around the pandemic drove me crazy from a management perspective. I, I don't, I, I like to make stuff. Yeah. I like to like, I like to work with people that I can collaborate with and I like to make stuff. There's two, they say there's two different kinds of entrepreneurs, those that start the company and those that keep the trains running on time. Yeah. And you're moving into the trains running on time phase of this to mm -hmm. some extent. And here's the other thing that I look at and I think has got to be a big transition for you. Taking outside financing. Now you have someone else that you have to answer to. Um, well, not whether they're a boss or not. You yeah, know, you, I, I guess I, I met. Go ahead and ask the question. Well, I mean, you were only answerable to yourself. And, and taking on financing for any business is a big change in the potential relationship of how that business runs. Yeah, but my, I, I could see how that would go with people, but my situation was so different. So we own, like, I owned Meat Eater, which was only a TV, it was just a TV show. It was nothing more than a TV show, okay? I owned Meat Eater as a joint venture with a production company. We didn't have any, like, we had no designated dedicated leadership and no like, like built in financial um, I'm trying to think how to put it, like how we kind of ran it. There, there was no like sort of mature finance organization about what we were doing as a business. Okay. We were rolled into a bunch of other broader projects and everyone was working on a bunch of things. When we took outside financing, we took it in order to like make a company. So for me being a person going it alone, I was a person cranking out a book every couple of years, right? I had big aspirations about what I wanted to do, no way to go and do it. So when I found financial partners and I work very closely with them now all the time, it wasn't that I had to like surrender something. There, there was nothing for that. There's nothing I surrendered. Like it was all upside to me because it enabled me to for, it enabled me to find a way to continue doing what I wanted to do in a way where I had like a, a much higher level of influence. I could definitely see people in a, in a different situation, but there's something like very peculiar about where I was at in that moment and had to do this in order to do it. It wasn't like I would do a smaller version on my own. Um, I could do a smaller version or a bigger version. It was that that had to be the version that had to happen. I see. Because of who you were before. Yeah, there wasn't like, there, there, I wasn't walking away. I wasn't walking away from something, right? I was just walking toward what I wanted to do, and that's how I was going to do it. Here's a question from West. Mm. Does it bother you when people call you Mr. Meat Eater? Or yeah. Meat Eater. It does? <laughs> <laughs> I, mean, like, I mean, like, you know, if a, a, a scale of one to ten bother, I guess it'd be down around the one, but... Yeah. yeah, no, Steve's good. That works for me. <laughs> <laughs> I will say, I told people, I'm going to interview the meat eater, you know? <laughs> I, I understand it, but uh, no, yeah, Steve, Steve works well. Charlie wanted to know, um, how do people who grow up in a city get into this, do what you do? Not what you do, but get into outdoorsmanship. If you live in New York City, you live in San Francisco, which, by the way, I've read you have big audiences in, yeah. the, in the city. Yeah, we do, yeah. How do they get into this? You just can't take no for an answer. You know what I mean? You just got to have like, you just got to decide you're going to do something to go do it, you know? And, and don't, don't be so picky about what version you're going to get right off the bat. When, you know, my, my two older kids were born and they were born in New York. We, when we had those kids, we were living in Brooklyn. 
man, we'd do all kinds of stuff, you know? We'd go out and just explore nature. We'd go to parks. We'd go fishing. We'd probably fish in places you're not supposed to fish. Um, we would just be out doing stuff. If we had a chance, again, leaving town for the weekend, we'd go up and go canoe down the Delaware and fish and just whatever. Like, you can't take no for an answer. We'd go to the parks and find wild edibles now and then that we could experiment and pick up acorns and I'd show them how to boil acorns to get the bitterness out of it. Uh, just going, we would make gardens. Um, yeah, you just, I find like if I had a gripe with people, it'd be that that's kind of a weird statement. One of my gripes with people, if I had a gripe with people, it would be that there's, I, people a lot of times have a sense of what they want to do, what they ought to be doing. And they just let everything get in their way. They get in the way of themselves. You know, it's like they, they just don't have, you have, like, w- when you want to do something, you have to decide, I'm doing this, and I do not care what happens. Like, we're going. Like, we're going. Right? You have to have that. If you don't have it, I don't know what's going to happen to you. No. Yeah. To I your point, you can tell me about that. that, though. Yeah. 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 And I think he's, you're going to be talking it. to him in a couple months. But, <laughs> yeah. yeah. And, and people would come up to him and be like, what are you doing? Yeah. I, I don't think you're allowed to do Whatever this. it is you're doing, I don't think you're supposed to. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But you can. Yeah. You can do it anywhere, to your point. Um. You know, there is an intimidation factor that people would put mm. in their own way as well. And again, I think I, to me, when you're being out, I know you told me your wife likes skiing and you don't count that as outdoorsmanship. No. Uh, it's just hunting and fishing. No, it feels like a, it feels like a man-made environment. <laughs> See, I think anything. I'll, surfing, for me personally, whatever it is, we started this conversation with, spirituality, I find the same thing when I'm sitting on the ocean that I do when I'm in the woods. Mm. But there's an intimidation factor for anybody I, paddling so, so, out. But here's the thing. The, in, I can't really defend this, but to me, surfing feels more, um, more <laughs> like the out, like feels more like the outdoors than skiing. Yeah, because, because the waves are there, but the snow—they're always pumping it out of those oh, snow. I see. Yeah, like if they had to like manufacture a wave, and they do, they do a wave pool. Yeah, I'd view a wave pool like I'd be like, eh, I'm a little skeptical. <laughs> But surfing's not perfect, but it's close. That's like, okay, I get, a, I get part of your philosophy. Now, you want things to be as close to its natural state as possible, and then for you to participate in that natural state. Well, yeah, but it's a little more complicated because I also want it to produce food. <laughs> okay, just, <laughs> that's your next level. Um, what, I really, any... what I really want is it produces food. <laughs> that's, why, that's interesting that that's so much a part of whatever it is your connection is to it, the food aspect. Yeah, I guess I'm just like, I'm like, uh, I have like Hiking a, doesn't do it for you. I have a problem. No, and it's, that, that's funny, too, because I like to go hiking. If I love to go hiking if I feel like I'm, like, scouting something out. Yeah. You know, but I could never, like, I could never be happy. Uh, it'd be hard for me to be happy hiking somewhere where I didn't feel like I was learning information that I might put to use in, in hunting and fishing. To go back and kill something. So I might go there and look around and be like, that's great, because I can at least write that area off. <laughs> <laughs> I don't see anything inter- interested me back there. But what about the intimidation factor for people? I mean, I'm, you, there's the gun involved. There's yeah. the ignorance involved. There's the ignorance confronted with expertise, being the guide. Even though you're paying a guide or you're paying an outfitter, there's a lot of intimidation involved in jumping into this. Yes, but, it, okay, a few years ago, I went to Paris with my wife, okay? And all I'd ever heard is like, oh, they're so mean to Americans. And if you don't know French, you're going to have, like, I went into it, like, I went into it probably, that I probably went into as, as nervous and paranoid as some people might be walking into a mountain range where there's grizzly bears, right? I went into it being like, oh, it's going to be miserable, and we're not going to know what to do, and we won't be able to find anything. And you go and you figure it out. We went and figured it out. My wife wasn't at all nervous about it, but I had apprehensions. And I went there, and everything was totally fine. I had a great time, right? We figured everything out. I think that you, like, you're stepping out of your comfort zone and you're going and doing something. If you're the kind of person that's going to look and be like, ah, just seems like too many problems, like what I might have been going to, you know, a city in another country, um, or someone grabs you by the ear and drags you along and you realize that all that fretting and worrying was totally unwarranted. And, And there's also like the worst case scenario. The worst, we went fishing yesterday. It was not good conditions. It was very windy to the point where we were even questioning at a point, if it gets any worse, it would be unsafe to be in boats on the water. So what was the worst case scenario that would have happened? We would have not caught anything. I can live with that. 
That was Wes's biggest fear. It wasn't falling in the water. Is I'm not a very good fisherman. Yeah, it's, it's like it's gonna be on TV. I'm totally fine. Like I can, I can, I can live with that. I can suffer a lot of unsuccessful outings. And so, if someone is looking at the 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 sphere of outdoor pursuits, narrowing on like the worst thing that would happen to you, mm-hmm. um, if, if it came to hunting and fishing, the worst thing that's gonna happen is you you don't get anything, or you get lost for a minute or turned around. But it's like Ask yourself, are you really going to die? Right. Probably not. Probably right. not. Last two things I want to ask you. So I'll tell you my story, and then I want to hear yours. The question is, why Montana? Mm-hmm. So we talked. I moved to Montana for a little while, and people asked me, why did you go to Montana? And I know my answer very, very specifically, and that is that I loved, loved the book and movie Lonesome Dove. And then secondarily, I loved the book Travels with Charlie by John Steinbeck. Okay. Which we now know he made up. A lot yeah. of that. He didn't actually travel across the country with his dog. Well, Lonesome Dove's made up. Well, but that, they, he's being honest. But the, Mercury, and, it's and, the Ol- and the Olive Hotel is in, you know, yeah. it's there in Miles City. So. So, so, but in Travels with Charlie, Steinbeck says, if you took a boy from Washington, D.C. and said, describe for me Texas, mm-hmm. what he would in actuality describe would be Montana. And I as a it. proud Texan, I'm like, well, I, I've got to move to Montana. I got it. So what, what made you make Montana the base of your operations in your home? Uh, I moved to Montana after I finished college, so it had been 1996. Uh, a dear friend of mine um, that I grew up with had moved to Montana as well. And when I was applying to graduate schools, I actually got a full ride at Colorado State. And I got no, and I applied to the MFA program at University of Montana and got in, but no assistance whatsoever. So I knew I'd have to come here and get a job. And there I had a full ride with a teaching scholarship or teaching fellowship. And I was sitting with my buddy who had moved to Montana. And I'm like, from a hunting fishing perspective, what do I want to do? And he's like, there's not a doubt in my mind, man. Like you don't want Colorado. You ought to go to Montana. I went and told my dad, I'm like, you know, I'm not going to take the full ride thing. I'm going to go somewhere where I got to pay and get a job. He was, he was, supportive but like thought I was insane um and that was the first time lived here for I think 11 years really liked it and had always kind of figured I was going to wind up Montana Wyoming Alaska just somewhere um wild yeah well more so a lot of stuff to do you just you know there's a lot to do here man you can't do it all um I like the mountains a lot I like the cold a lot I like the diversity of things from, from a landscape perspective. Mm-hmm. So I just knew I was going to wind up somewhere back here and it took a long time. And I don't know where I'll ultimately, I don't know where I'll ultimately wind up anyway. I like to joke with my wife that, you know, eventually we're going to move to Toke, Alaska. Um, I don't know that that will happen. Probably not, but it's like, uh, I just, uh, I have a hard time, um, settling down, you know, or settling in just today when I was driving my kid to school, He's like, do you like Montana? I'm like, yeah, I love it. He goes, oh, because you always talk about where you're going to go next. Oh, really? <laughs> yeah. He brought it up just this morning. I'm not kidding. We should have similarity. I feel like I've been too much of a nomad in my family's life, like never mm-hmm. allowing them to fully plant their roots in mm-hmm. one place. Oh, we're not going to stay in New York. But we're really Texans. We're oh, yeah. go back. And I, I, I wonder, I struggle with that. you got to give people a sense of roots, but also a sense of adventure at the same time. Yeah, I can't. But our little boy, our, our oldest, I think he went, he went six or seven years and never... He went six or seven years in six or seven houses yeah, or or something like that. A lot, you know, to to the point where um, this is the first time, this is the first time that they've been, that our kids have been allowed to like really settle in Mm -hmm. to an environment where there's not talk of like perhaps immediately doing something different. And we've kind of given them a a commitment that we'll hold tight while they do the whole school thing. Like I, I, I really can't picture uprooting them again. We put them through a lot. It's a couple of decades then for here in yeah. Montana. Yeah, uh, unless they come and say, like, we're out of here and they all want to move. But, but right now, I think it'd be a little bit brutal to, to do that to them again. All right, let's end where we started. I kind of started talking about parenting and spirituality with you. So you said something in the middle of our conversation I want to follow up on. You said, um, if I had a tombstone, I would want it to say writer instead of television star. But then you said, but I'm not going to have a tombstone. Why? Oh, um, I, I know where I want. Uh, ideally... I know where I want my ashes spread, and I've explained it to people. Um, ideally, though, and this, this is, I'm only, I'm only mostly joking. Ideally, though, I'd like just my whole body brought out there and let, just set out there on a, 
patch of trees or something and, and let whatever happens, happens. But um, barring that, it'd be long. It's a long way to carry it. Uh, barring that, I would just like to have my ashes dumped. And just, Where? Psh, I'm not going to tell you. <laughs> but you have it picked out. <laughs> oh, I can tell you a little bit. You see that brown skull back there? Not far from where I found that. Well, your wife already told me where you found that, so <laughs> she doesn't now, know I where I found that. <laughs> now I can desecrate the ashes. <laughs> she doesn't know where I found that. But not you know, a... you know, you want your oh, ashes yeah. spread. No, and I've, explained, I've explained it to multiple people. And at some point, I'll write it down in great detail Why? for my kids. Why is that what you want? Because it was, um, it, uh, it's in this state. Because that came, uh, there was a time in my life when I had sort of entered my um the, the height of my professional insecurity coming out of school, coming out of graduate school. And I just, and I honestly didn't know what was going to happen to me. Like I didn't really know what happened to people who finished like, you know, I was getting an MFA, right? There's, there's zero practicality coming out of that. I was just, I honestly didn't know. I mean, in the most like highest level existential order did not know what would happen to me. But at that time, I was spending a lot of time in this place because we were up there a lot, messing around. And it became just like a, a, a favorite place of mine. And I felt very much at ease there. And what's interesting, years later when I was living in New York, um, I happened to be out here messing around. and was back in that area. And it almost it had like, almost like put a lump in my throat, right, to see that place. And I was like, God, I like that place. So that's where. Where I dump it. You know what's funny? I haven't, been, I haven't been back there in probably 10 years. I've seen you try to struggle to describe what you are. Environmentalist, environmentalist with a gun, conservationist, hunter. I don't know, I don't, is it, I don't know exactly what a naturalist is, but there's something. I like that too. There's something key to you about, and I think it ties into even the skiing thing. You know, there's something key to you about the natural state of things. I mean, provided that you can get food from it and mm -hmm. something, but you kind of don't. Beyond government policy, and I don't, we could do that conversation, but I think it's deeper than that for you. Like, you, you know, you want sort of the, the untarnished, the back to the natural, this is my observation, natural yeah. state of things, including the way that you go out. Yeah, I want, I, I want something that actually confuses a lot of people because they can't reconcile, they can't reconcile conservation, environmentalism with the fact that you kill animals or kill fish, right? They, they can't reconcile it. Mm -hmm. Some people can't, you know. Um, and it confuses people. Like what I talk about confuses people. Um, but I, I want something that, that strikes me as being like extremely simple. Uh, I want clean, healthy wildlife habitat, clean air, clean water, lots of animals, right? Vibrant ecosystems. And I want access to those natural resources mm -hmm. if, if, they can be, if they can be utilized in a sustainable fashion. Like it's very simple. Um, those are the things I want, as much as it baffles people. They don't know, they know what to make out of it. I think I know what to make out of it. Yeah. No, I bet you do. <laughs> I bet you do. When I say they, yeah. I mean, there are those who, who yeah. that confuses. But, yeah, you get it. This has been awesome. Thank you for yesterday. So much time with us. Uh, all the time you gave me as well today. It's been yeah, awesome, man. appreciate Thank it, man. You. It's good to meet it's you. It's good to get to know you.